Hello. This is a series looking at 10,000 years of Indian history. From around 10,000 BC with just Mesolithic hunter-gatherers to 200 BC with the huge modern empire and the Tamil kings. This is part 3 about the Mesolithic and Neolithic in peninsular India. So if you haven't watched parts 1 and 2 where I cover northern and northwestern India, I do recommend you go and watch it. I'll leave the links in the description. Especially part 1 where I go through an overview of terms like Holocene, Mesolithic or Bronze Age. In this video, I will be focusing on Peninsular India that is all areas south of the Narmada but mainly focusing on the Deccan in South India. The Holocene story in South India in general is pretty incomplete because we have very very few settlement sites and there are practically no sites where we can see an increase in social complexity from Mesolithic to food production and agriculture to iron usage and then copper and bronze and so on. For that reason, let's focus on a totally awesome material artifact from this period, cave and rock art. Peninsular India has lots and lots of examples and there are probably a lot more to be discovered out there. Some of these are very impressive for the scale and detail and quality of work, such as the recently discovered ones in Ratnagiri and Rajapur districts in Maharashtra, over a thousand of them in fact. This find is still very new, just 3 or 4 years old, so we can always expect new research to come out. But what we know now is, there are more than 52 sites across the region, and the artwork ranges from the usual simple human and animal carvings you expect from the Mesolithic, but also elephants, aquatic animals, abstract geometric patterns, and so on. Interestingly enough, it also includes animals like hippopotamuses and rhinos which aren't seen in the region today. I'll give a link in the description to this photographer's blog. He has travelled to a lot of these sites in the Konkan and covered them extensively. One of the most impressive at the ones in Konkan is the so-called master of animals engraving. I mean check out the sheer scale of this thing. What's curious about this one is its similarity to the ones you find in a lot of places in the world. Not just the Indus Valley but also Mesopotamia and Egypt. There are similar rock art sites found in Goa such as those found at Uzgalimal and the Western Ghats. Similar types of Mesolithic rock and cave art is found in other southern states too. Karnataka, Andhra and Telangana put together have hundreds of sites where Mesolithic rock art has been found. The number from Kerala and Tamil Nadu is a little less and they are usually from the later periods. One interesting pattern found in most rock art sites across peninsular India is that you see an evolution in the style and content of art done by people as their subsistence pattern and the world around them changes. So for example in the earliest stages. 8,000 or 10,000 years ago, you would find mostly wild animals, mountain goats, deers, hippos and sometimes human figures of hunters with spear tips and so on, especially in Karnataka. Some of these also have a mystical character to them. You find people with headdresses and stuff like processions and so on. Now later, in the period when agriculture starts, you start seeing drawings of cattle. Now the presence of cattle is a good way to date these paintings. I'll explain this in more detail later on, but in short. The cow was not domesticated in southern India. We know when cattle starts appearing in southern Karnataka, so any paintings depicting cattle further south will be later than this. Kerala is a special case because it's not just the climate but the entire geography of the state which is different than today. 10,000 to 12,000 years ago the sea levels were lower, right, all over the world. And the same in the western coast of India. The backwaters of Kerala right next to the present day coast, it didn't exist. Now, Kerala is already a place which is pretty green for the amount of rain it receives. Now, imagine a Kerala where you get 50% more rain than today. An entire landscape of evergreen forest stretching from the western ghats right up to the coastline. And then somewhere between 9000 and 6000 years ago, the western coast gets hit from both sides. Short, fast moving rivers from the western ghats which already carry a lot of sediment on one side and a slowly rising sea level on the other. The end result? the entire coastal forest gets submerged. The reason we know all of this is because researchers have been able to dig up mostly intact tree trunks from places in interior Kerala. And then, the sea starts coming in further, roughly stopping around the line shown on this map here. Then it starts going back over a few hundred years. The Vemrad Lake, kind of the face of Kerala sometimes to the outside world, is very new, maybe 2000 to 3000 years old, that's it. This submerged forest is part of the reason why you get peat deposits locally known as curry, when you dig deep in areas of Kutanar in Kerala. Now imagine you are a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer in prehistoric Kerala's coast or somewhere in the interior of the thick forest. 
dense evergreen forest where it rains half the year is already not a great place to be as a hunter gatherer so there's already less people around whatever tools you made if it was somewhere in the interior of the country could still end up being preserved for archaeologists to find here not a chance anything you left is probably beneath the fields of kutanad now all of this to say mesolithic evidence in kerala where it exists is in the high ranges so what changed why did southern india shift from a hunter gatherer lifestyle to settled agriculture a immediate response would be well that's just what people do right we led such difficult lives for such a long time and then through a stroke of genius decided to start growing our own food around 12000 years ago well no the very first video on this channel was about moving away from such a simplistic narrative so i do recommend you go check it out in short it is important to realize that these are not people or communities at lower levels of some technology tree which goes from hunting and gathering to industrial civilization shifting to agriculture and the surplus which came with it led to our modern world sure but it didn't come easy the agricultural revolution was not one single light bulb moment this transition took a few thousand years literally and it always ran the risk of bad weather whereas our previous lifestyle was more adaptable and resilient so you can appreciate why most nomadic communities wouldn't have felt the need to settle down immediately in most of the independent origins of agriculture what we see is that it was taken up for multiple climate change related reasons again check out my first and third videos so what about southern india what was the reason agriculture started here the south indian neolithic might seem a little less exciting agriculture started here a few thousand years later than it had started in the middle east or northwest india it is interesting however because it is a complex story not a straightforward one where either migrating farmers introduced agriculture or hunter gatherers settled down and picked it up independently most of the information about the south indian neolithic is from a few papers by authors such as dorian fuller and ravi corsetier so you could check them out from academia.edu i'll leave the links in the description what we know with some certainty from multiple research papers about historic climates is this southern india was much more warm and humid and more forested at the start of the holocene that is roughly from 12000 to 5000 years ago it received a lot more rain too as much as 50% extra from present day the landscape was also different so for example interior karnataka which looks like this now would have looked more like this now in this changed landscape the animals found there would have also been different that partly explains why we see rock art of animals like hippos and the sort now from around 5000 to 4000 bc the climate starts changing the rain start decreasing this is part of a global change the sahara which was green and kind of looked like this started becoming more like the hot desert we know it today savanna to desert and southern india starts going from forest to savanna this is a problem for people who have gotten used to the environment being around them the way it is for thousands of years when the forest shrinks and the savanna expands there's less wild food to be found some groups start settling down the beginnings of an independent neolithic in peninsula and southern india A lot of important sites of this time are found in broadly this region of the southern Deccan between the Bhima, Krishna and the Tungabhadra rivers. The sites for these are found in places like Changanakallu and Kubgal in Karnataka. They mostly domesticate crops like mung bean, horse gram and some millets. Almost parallelly, we see the presence of a new group of people or a new type of livelihood, pastoralists. Pastoralism is a sort of nomadic livelihood where you are dependent on domestic animals like cows or sheep or goats or whatever animals which you can herd and move from place to place even hundreds of kilometers a landscape full of forests is unsuitable for keeping cows but these newly formed savannas would be excellent for that from the presence of animal bones from the earliest sites what it looks like is southern india was agropastoral from the start not just agricultural So did these people move into southern India from somewhere else? One strong piece of evidence is the animals themselves. In these new neolithic settlements, we find evidence of the presence of sheep, goat and cattle. Cows, especially through huge ash mounds where cow dung was burnt. And I'll get to these interesting ash mounds in a bit. 
None of these animals were domesticated in southern India. It happened in northwest India. There are other lines of evidence that this migration could have happened. Language and genetics. I'm just not saying this on the basis of cows alone. But for this series, I'll just stick to evidence from material culture. Right around this time, we also see the introduction of new millet crops, etc., which have an African origin. Could these new migrants have brought these crops? Always, always remember that I'm not describing changes happening over 10 or 20 or 50 years. All of this would have happened over centuries. Now the ash mounds. These were large heaps of dung, cow dung, which were heaped together and burned. And some of these were really huge. The one at this place called Kuratini in Karnataka was 130 meters in diameter and 10 meters high. The size and high temperatures achieved gives us the idea that this burning actually had some sort of ritual importance. It seems like these ash mounds are a particular stage in the creation of a new settlement. So these pastoralists, they move into a new place and over 150, 200 years, that is 8 or 10 generations, build up cow dung in a particular area which is then periodically burnt. These sites then become monuments in the landscape, villages getting established nearby and people living there getting associated to these monuments their ancestors built hundreds of years ago. And we have evidences of extensive settlements, cattle pens, houses, evidence of agriculture and so on. Many of these Ashmont sites such as ones at Budihal seems to have become places where different Neolithic communities came together, had feasts, exchanged prestige goods and so on. In Budihal we have the evidence of a large area was where cattle were slaughtered. And then if they were expanding, a new site would be selected, dung burned there, and then a settlement created near the ash mound. I know I've been saying cow dung and ash mound a lot, and from our present day perspective, a huge pile of ash from burned dung being a monument can seem a little weird. But that's one of the challenges of studying history, right? Learning to look past the specifics and appreciating the universals. Even these people from Southern Deccan, thousands of years ago, had the impulse to create something long-lasting, establish their mark on the landscape which their descendants would consider important, and bring communities together, right? And we know so much about these people just from these ash mounds. So what about the hunter-gatherers who occupied southern India before this? Did they all die? Were they all forcibly assimilated? What we have is a much more complicated picture. Hunter-gatherer tribes and chiefdoms which coexisted and traded with agricultural villages for a long time even 1000, 2000 years since agriculture started in southern India. Even pepper, Kerala's most famous export in history. Pepper wasn't cultivated in large plantations like today, obviously. It was collected or cultivated by hill tribes which exchanged it to the lowland communities who then traded it in the newly formed ports. But all places don't have such happy stories, of course. As agricultural or pastoral communities expand, they also displace and restrict nomadic communities from the most productive lands. This paper, for example, which tracked the history of an area near Madurai, suggests that when agro-pastoral groups moved into this area, there was both conflict and cooperation. Some nomadic groups were driven out, whereas some could trade. All this was about Southern Deccan. What about the Deep South? From this period, Neolithic habitation sites in Kerala and Southern Tamil Nadu were, sadly enough, almost completely absent. In fact, the only pieces of evidence we have from Kerala are stuff like Neolithic hand axes. They are called Neolithic celts or shells, I think. And there are quite a few of them, spread out all over Tamil Nadu and Kerala. More will be found in due time. For instance, in 2019, a Neolithic celt was discovered from a riverbed in Kanyakumari district. And much like what I told about the rock art, even these stone tools become part of local culture and religion. For example, Neolithic stone tools were worshipped at tribal hamlets in Tamil Nadu's Javadu hills. In Kerala, most Neolithic shells have been discovered in the hilly districts and usually near rock shelters with rock art. So for example, near the Edakal Caves or Manandavadi and so on. Usually when we talk about Kerala's ancient history, what comes to mind is international pepper trade with the Romans and being part of ancient Tamilakam and so on and so forth. But that kind of social complexity doesn't develop immediately. It needs the base of agricultural food surplus. But we're not sure about its origins in Kerala. I mean, contrast this with how much we know about the Indus Valley civilization, right? 
we do know about its most advanced urban phase but we have evidence archaeological evidence going back to the earliest phases the earliest origins of agriculture there in kerala the neolithic could have taken some time to get started do you remember the part about rains decreasing kerala even with the reduced rains of the late holocene that is something close to what we get today might have remained very attractive to a hunter gatherer way of lifestyle the people here wouldn't have faced food insecurity and felt the need to settle down and start food cultivation in the way people in the more semi arid regions of the deccan felt this is slowly changing though and more and more neolithic sites are getting discovered in kerala and tamil nadu such as the ones in attapadi and other places in palakkad all of this was building up towards one of the most interesting periods in south indian history the megalithic leading up to the sangam age in the next video i will talk about these huge monuments of stone built all over south india what we know about the people who constructed them and the long period leading up to the first urbanization in tamilnadu thank you and see you in the next one